Excellent. Woo, we got a lot of faces out there. Welcome here, everybody. Welcome here. So again, my name is Joe Valevsky, Naturalist at Wolf Ridge. We got a lot of folks who are joining us. And, and what I think is gonna be the most fun is that not only do we have a lot of people who are joining us to watch, but we have a lot of people ready to share stories with you. And the stories we're gonna be sharing are all about our virtual field trips, the things that we've been doing this past year during the pandemic. Wolf Ridge uh, didn't disappear completely, even though it felt like it at times, uh, but what we've been doing is virtual field trips. And we've been doing that now uh, for the past several months, but especially the past few weeks, it's really kicked into overdrive. And oh my gosh, this past Monday, we were with the Prior Lake School area or Prior Lake Savage area schools with Sandy, Sandy Timmerman. And so we've invited her uh, to share a little bit of her story. And that's how we're going to get started. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to spotlight her and you, my friend, are on everybody's screen right now. Thank you for being here, Sandy. Thank you, Joe. And congratulations to Wolfridge on your 50 years. Um, my first experience at Wolfridge was in 1986. And I was going to Isabella as a brand new teacher experiencing a whole new way of teaching. I was bit by the Wolfridge bug and I couldn't wait to go again. We were one school going for one week. Now, presently, we are seven different schools and we take up three different weeks at Wolf Ridge. I know my story is probably no different than many of yours, but for me, each year when the bus reaches the bottom of that driveway, I get this feeling that I'm coming home. The people at Wolf Ridge have become my extended family. Joe, you and I spent our first year working together talking by phone, because if you remember correctly, I couldn't go on the trip because I was pregnant. That was the October in 1991, the Halloween blizzard. I was at home while our school spent some extra days, two days to be exact, snowed in. Of course, our students weren't stuck inside. They were experiencing a true Minnesota blizzard. Of course, I've, you've all heard the stories I'm sure about that and what needed to be done, how people had to be brought up to campus and supplies brought up to campus to feed two school groups that were stuck. I know on Prior Lake, it's a badge of honor to be part of that year. Then there was 1992, one year later, when I left for Wolf Ridge on my son's first birthday. I will never forget going to the cafeteria that day and walking in and seeing this one-year-old little girl sitting in a height chair with her dad having lunch. Pete and Sue, thank you for letting me mm -hmm. love on your daughter that week. Each year when I get to Wolf Ridge, I catch up with what's happening on the hill, but I also find out what's happening with your families. Joe and I have been following through the years with our children, moving from us being the center of their world to them caving in their rooms and now to having them back interacting with us. <laughs> then there was the remodeling of Mac Lodge and the camper trailers. And we had a school staying in them that last week before they were leaving. And of course, that's when we got about six to 12 inches of snow in October. Another Wolf Ridge memory that only a few people got to experience. There is where our partnership began and we began developing those trusting relationships and friendships. In 2006, when our trip was cut from our district budget and we had major budget cuts in our district, we had to make a plan. It was in the conference room at Wolf Ridge with the help of Pete Smerud facilitating that an idea was formed and a group of teachers and parents started a volunteer group in our community called Friends of Wolf Ridge to raise money to keep the trip, trip going. Since then, the trip has been added back into the budget, but that group still exists and raises money for scholarships to pay for students who can't afford. Again, another partnership with Wolfridge making things happen. Our district started coming to Wolfridge sometime in the late 70s, early 80s. So we know we have a 40 year history and partnership. As our district became more passionate about ESTEM, we looked to Wolfridge. Our teachers went up in the summer when you had those teaching institutes in June to bring stronger practices into our classrooms. We had Joe come down and work directly with our teachers in 
that was even recently, I think this fall, to help take our curriculum and apply it to our outdoor spaces. And then the pandemic hit last spring. And once again, we look to Wolf Ridge for your adventures in learning. As a school, as a school approaches this fall, it became very clear in the passing months that we would be missing our trip this year. And because of this partnership, I set up a meeting again with Pete and tossed out an idea to have some type of virtual experience. Our fifth grade teachers did not just want an EE experience, they wanted Wolfridge. They wanted the people and the feel of the trip. Thanks to Wolfridge and to our assistant superintendent, Jeff Holmberg and our fifth grade staff, over about a three month period of time, we put together a virtual experience that aligns with our fifth grade spring science curriculum. Students are following three themes, forest ecology, animal science, and birds. There are three virtual assemb assemblies that have 26 of our classrooms going to. 78 individual lessons with Wolfridge naturalists will be happening and a whole lot of learning for our fifth graders. Thanks to our friends of Wolfridge group, they did, all the, they did the funding and our families do not have to pay for anything. In closing, I would like to say that Wolfridge is not just a school camp experience. It is so much deeper. It's about teaching our students about the natural world around them and promoting outdoor learning and the values that go with it. They learned to work collaboratively and live in a community with others. As teachers, we see the best teaching practices in action to bring them into our own classrooms. I believe it is the Wolfridge experience that bonds us to students unlike any other teaching year. I've been going on this trip for 33 years. Over that time, I've met with so many wonderful people because of Wolfridge. Some of my closest, dearest friends are the teachers that I've gone to Wolfridge with. I believe our fifth grade team in Prior Lake Savage Area Schools is one of the hardest working collaborative groups of people I know, and it's because of their Wolfridge experience. I look forward to the day when I can come to Wolfridge and feel like I'm back at my second home. But for now, I'm so happy we can still stay connected through virtual learning. Thank you for inviting me tonight and for allowing me to share my story. Oh, Sandy, thank you so much. Now, what, what maybe some people don't realize is that Wolf Ridge is the way that it is because of people like you. You make this place what it is. And the rest of us just get to do our little happy dance around you. So thank you for being part of this. And speaking of happy dance, oh my gosh, I think we've got somebody out there in the snow ready to teach. <laughs> I am out in the snow. Thanks for that lovely um, story and introduction, S Sandy. That was great to hear. Uh, hello, everybody. My name is Danielle, and I am first and foremost a naturalist at Wolf Ridge, but I also do all sorts of other things. I help to co-run our graduate program, and I'm on our curriculum team and our live animal team. And I am so excited to be outside with you tonight. Now, this is extra special because we've never got to do a virtual field trip at night. So we've got all sorts of little lights around. You can see the little twinkle lights back there. It's, it's pretty amazing. Um, somebody asked me in the chat as we got on if I was in a snow cave right now. And you know, I tricked you. I'm not quite in a snow cave yet this is the entrance where that green glow is coming from because there's more cool lights in there but I wanted to start outside because I wanted to get a couple different temperatures as we explore what is a snow cave why are they cool um, getting some air temperatures out here and then comparing it to what it might be like in there I thought would be pretty neat uh, but before we do that I just want you all, wherever you're at, there's so many screens spread out all over, all over Minnesota, I'm mostly guessing, but maybe even some other places. Um, so take a moment where you are and just look around your surroundings. And I want you to think of three things that you can see right now. And two things that you can hear 
and one thing that you can feel. Well, if I could describe mine to you a little bit, I can bring you along with me. Um, what I am seeing right now is I can see the moon uh, just barely peeking through the clouds overhead. I see some snow falling, super, super tiny snowflakes. I bet you don't really see them through the screen. And I also see the door to the snow cave right next to me here. Uh, things I'm hearing, gosh, just about nothing. It is really quiet out. And I'm surrounded by these big walls that are really insulating. And so I don't hear much, but I guess I hear the swish of my coat and I can hear little rumblings from the Zoom. So there we go. I'm not alone. I have a phone, right? Um, and then something I feel, my butt's pretty cold. I'm sitting just on the snow with no insulation in between. Um, so now that we've taken a moment just to explore your own space, but also come into my space, I'm so excited to share this snow cave with you all tonight. So we were approached by a student science conference in, I don't know, November, and they, they wanted to do some lessons with us. And as it progressed, we knew the lessons would be happening in January or February. And she asked, she was like, could you do something around snow recreation and snow science and um, I shared that with our team and right away people started dreaming up like oh we should make a snow cave because building a snow cave is a pretty big tradition at Wolfridge but I will tell you usually we have about 20 student and mentor Nats to naturalists to help us out we did not have that this year <laughs> but what we did have instead are some amazing volunteers sarah and jenna thank you so much for hosting this space and lending your muscles and carrie and Lori were out here too piling up this big uh snow cave so that we could dig it out and we got to make a really cool video about the process and share it with that conference um so i want to bring you inside but before I do that, we got to check our thermometer here to see what temperature the outside air is. Okay, 13 degrees. And now it's time for a little snow cave tour. So I'm out at the entrance. There's two big walls out on the side of me here. And of course, some little fairy lights. I am going to put you on mute and stop the camera while I crawl in because I don't want to make anybody sick. So. You can count to 15 and hopefully I'll be back. I suspect that it's the same temperature right outside there as it is in Texas. Huh? Huh? All the stuff we've heard is probably the same temperature. <laughs> My goodness, they should build a snow cave down there so they can stay warm, I think. <laughs> So I'm looking at this and it looks like we have 73 people with us. And if there's a couple smiling faces in each screen, that's quite a few people showing up this evening. So thank you again for everybody who's shown up. In a moment, Danielle will be back. Hi, everybody. Uh, I made it inside. Oh, John D from Tennessee. I was wondering if that was you. <laughs> Hi, John. Um, I have made it inside of the snow cave. And what I'd really like to do is just show you how swanky it is in here. So one moment. We got a bean bag. We got snacks. We got chairs. We got <laughs> candles. We got rugs. Insulation. Look at this. We even got in ceiling lighting there. My goodness, Jenna and Sarah, shout out to you and your snow cave construction here. Um, so this snow cave is big enough to sleep a, a few people in here. And what you really wanna do is you, you wanna close off the door as I came in, cause that can start to trap in my own body heat. So as I am in here, I'm gonna start to warm it up. Cause believe it or not, snow is super insulating. It has all these air pockets in it because the snowflakes as they fall down they leave air pockets and it is a really insulating layer which animals they know all about so they've been hanging out in that layer right between the ground and the first layer of snow it's called the subnivian zone and in that layer 
there's all sorts of small mammals that hang out down there or grouse, those birds. They like to go in, in there and stay nice and warm during the winter time. So essentially we've made a subnivian zone for humans here. Now, no snow cave is good though, without, your, without a cup of tea and some snacks, which I've been set up here so nicely with, with some snacks. I even have a couple candles. I'm gonna light one if you don't mind for a moment. Oh yeah. Now what lighting a candle can do or having your body heat inside your snow cave for a while, what it does is it, it seasons the inside, right? So seasoning it means it'll build up a layer of ice right on the inside so that it's extra strong and sturdy. And I don't know, maybe if any of you have built a snow cave before, could you throw it into the chat? Just say like a, yeah, I built one. I'd be so curious. So Josh Leonard just said that it's the swankiest snow cave he has ever seen, ever. <laughs> <laughs> it's super swanky. <laughs> and as people are thinking of whether or not they've ever made a snow cave before, um, snow caves are, are an extremely practical form of of shelter when your main resource for shelter is snow. So thinking about the, the indigenous people to the high Arctic regions, snow caves or igloos have been a very traditional form of shelter for many, many, many years. Um, we are in a snow cave or a Quincy, which means that we piled up the snow, we let it sinter. And when it sinters, that's what makes it nice and strong. So that's what makes all those individual snowflakes come together as one in a solid block, which is what makes it safe. Um, after you've let it center, we let this one center for like a week, which made it pretty hard to dig out. Um, but then you come back and you carve out your space. Some people will even put shelves up so that your body is up closer to the top of your snow cave, because as heat rises, this is going to be the warmest spot of the snow cave, right? Um, and all sorts of various things. But an igloo, an igloo is different. That uh, igloos are originate in even higher Arctic altitudes where it's really humid because you need a very specific type of snow to cut out the snow blocks. And then you use those snow blocks to make up your igloo and carve it from there. And where snow caves traditionally are more like a temporary shelter, like you, you need it, you're out hunting or something like that, you can throw up a snow cave and use it for a couple days a week. Igloos were more like seasonal dwellings and used for an entire season. So, you know, I'm gonna check our temperature now, but then I think I'll pass it off to somebody else and we can just keep checking this throughout the night to see if it increases while my body and my candle are inside. And we're at 18 degrees at the moment. Cool. So keep keep track of that, everybody. 18 degrees, and we're going to find out. Now, there was one person here who was a little worried about you uh, melting your snow cave with a candle in there. We're going to find out, huh? Yeah, I with just a candle, we should be okay. Um, it's also really thick. So we made the walls intentionally like at least a foot and a half thick so that they're extra strong. But you do want to be careful, especially when you get to the shoulder seasons of when your snow cave is going to come down. They're all going to come down, especially in Minnesota. We do have a summer, believe it or not. Um, so you want to be careful of that. <laughs> and I also want to give a shout out to Heron, who builds one every single year, apparently. Heron is age eight right now, so we've got eight snow caves in line already. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> and even John D said that he made one. John Diego up in Grand Rapids. That's really fun. Excellent. Excellent. So we've got all those types of things. <gasps> Lauren Cottrell is here. Well, hello, my friend. Uh, what we're going to do now is we're going to shift here to a new person. I think that what we're going to do is shift to me. See, I was forgetting who is next, and apparently it's me. So I want to share a little something with you that virtual field trips uh, are something new for Wolfridge. And you all might know Wolfridge 
by looking at it, maybe not from this perspective, but by looking at it as a landscape, as a place. And so you can see that there's a couple lakes there, Wolf Lake and Raven Lake. And then you see that third lake off in the distance, Lake Superior. That's that blue strip that's over there. It's not sky, that's Lake Superior. So we think of Wolf Ridge and we think of that place, the campus, and yet we've been exploring it differently this year. So we have to start out with what does Wolf Ridge, the program, look like? And I'll tell you, this is what Wolf Ridge, the program, looks like when it's at its best. Uh, what it is, is it's bringing uh, passionate people together with very curious and excited learners and putting them in amazing spaces so that everybody can learn something. And they're learning not only from that naturalist, but they're also learning from each other. And maybe more importantly, they're learning from the landscape. And that landscape is one of our teachers. Now, when we shifted to virtual field trips, I got to tell you, this is what I felt like, okay? I felt like Moose Johnson. Anybody who knows Moose Johnson uh, knows what kind of a cantankerous spirit he has. And I just was like, we can't do this. This is crazy. What I'm used to doing is being outdoors with real people. And then other people like Danielle showed me what's possible. So this is a little bit of what it looks like that you see that I'm over there in the top corner, then Danielle. And then we've got the landscape, Raven Lake. And what you don't see is that we have chickadees over in that fourth box. And so we have four teachers here. Actually, there's more than four, but the four that I wanna bring up right now is one person in the field. And even though it looks like Danielle is outside, she's actually inside at a computer there. We've got the landscape as teacher, and we have the animals that are around us that are teachers. And I was shocked to learn just a couple days ago that this is what it looks like back at the classroom. And it's a little creepy for myself to look at this and see myself a dozen or so times on those laptops. But this is me teaching lichens to a group of fourth graders, which was super fun, oh my gosh. A year ago, a year ago, actually, I couldn't even imagine using a cell phone. I don't own a cell phone, okay? And yet I'm teaching online now and it's because of my team encouraging me. And so this is what it looks like. This is what we strive for. And yet we're putting this in that virtual space. So what does that mean? Well, it means that we need to embrace wild learning, or at least what I'm calling wild learning, that it's spontaneous, it's messy. Sandy, you know how messy it can be around here, right? <laughs> you never quite know what's about to happen. And the landscape is a teacher. And you know what? We really embrace the social and the emotional learning as well. And so it's not all about the facts. In fact, I was reading some literature recently. I've been doing some research on education and learning. And this right here, it says human and animals learn, human and animal learning is largely unsupervised. And you all are in my way, I have to move you. We discover the structure of the world by observing it, not by being told the name of every object. Now, uh, teachers know that, right? And, and that, especially at Wolf Ridge, where we try to really embrace that. But what I wanna do is I wanna put this quote into context because this was a 2020 article in a scientific journal and it was about artificial intelligence. Okay, so this is people who are trying to build computers that are super smart, artificial intelligence. And what they did was they ended up hitting a wall of how fast their computers could learn because they kept feeding it information and they realized that they needed to try to model after all animals, all animal life. And, 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 that, and that it's not just about learning names of things, that it's discovering the structure of the world by observing it. And that's what Danielle was just doing with us there in the snow cave. And that's what we're trying to embrace with virtual field trips. It's not about telling people names. That's easy. You could do a video and then just tell people names of things. And that's important. We have to have language, but it's also about helping learners to discover the structure of the world by observing it. And we know that teaching is relationship building. And so when we think of that, oftentimes we think about the relationship between the teacher and the learners. But at Wolf Ridge especially, we try to involve the landscape, whether it's chickadees or snow 
or a snow cave or apparently snacks, Danielle. They're all teachers, right? And, and that this is really important to us and we try to bring that all in. And as we've been exploring that, we have learned that we have to use lots of different tools and techniques. And so the next person that I want to share with you is gonna be David Steeler, who's gonna share with you just a little bit about the tools and the techniques that we've been exploring. Thank you, Joe. Yeah, so I'm gonna talk about um, the different things that resources that we've uh, found to use. And a lot of these we hadn't used at all before uh, March of last year. So the first thing that we um, found that we ran into that has helped a lot um, is the what is uh, the story maps feature, and this is based off of Esri's um, ArcGIS platform. So we can bring cool things like maps and things into this as well. So this is our watersheds adventures and learning lesson that we created, and uh, it's just an online lesson that kids could teachers could use and just uh, log into. They just need the link which we sent out to them. Um, and then you can see, we can scroll through and see different pictures as we go. And I'll tell you all about um, the lesson. And one of the things that we brought in with this Adventures in Learning was we actually started filming each other and uh, kind of created a story to go along with each of these. So we, each of these Adventures in Learning, we have a little video that goes along with it that kind of introduces the topic. And then this story map has more of the um, nuts and bolts of that topic, talking about um, like vocabulary, um, asking questions and things like that. I'm just gonna play a little bit of this video so you can see what these looked like when we put them all together. This will be just about a minute clip here. Welcome to Wolf Ridge and the North Shore. My name is Robbie. And my name is Caroline. Today we're going to be your naturalists as we explore watersheds. We can't see a whole lot from the desk here. Why don't we take a look around? You might be wondering what a watershed is. A watershed is an area of land that channels water into a creek, a lake, or a river, and then eventually flows into a larger body of water, like an ocean. Wolf Ridge is located in the Lake Superior watershed, and today we're going to explore watersheds. There, so you get an idea of what um, those videos that we created looked like. Again, none of us are professionals in the um, in making videos, but we all worked together as a team to put these together. We also still had um, some of our seasonal mentor naturalists back then to help out um, help us create those. So as we go through, then each of these lessons was connected to a standard. So this one starts to talk about um, mapping. And if we go down, you'll start to see the power of the story maps feature um, and why it's um, nice to have it connected to the ArcGIS platform. So here um, we can create maps and have different images with them. So this one talks about how the water flows from the top of Wolf Ridge down into Lake Superior. So at the top of the ridge here, and then the map's gonna follow along with us. Um, we get running downhill, we get to Sawmill Creek, there we go, we're gonna zoom in a bit here. And then to the Baptism River. And then finally out to Lake Superior. And each of these lessons then, uh, we created a about a 30 minute or so lesson that uh, teachers could use in their classroom or even students just at home, back when it was all distance learning, they could hop on and learn about more about it. Um, each of these co were connected to some outdoor component, and then they also had a little journaling thing at the end to talk about it. Um, we also tried to include other information from other websites and people, you know, experts who know about this stuff too at the end um, where it was applicable. So that was one of the things that we have used quite a bit. And um, there are some other features that we learned to use as well. So this is another one. We bought, bought some 360 degree cameras and this is a picture of an animal signs um, out on Raven Lake. 
So you can go around, you can actually scroll through the picture, which is pretty cool. I'll try not to go too fast, not make anyone dizzy here. But then we can see all these little plus signs and we can click on them and say, what is this telling us about? Oh, there's fox tracks there. And there's a nice picture of them. This one right here, we have a beaver lodge. That's pretty cool too. Um, but then we learned that we can go above and beyond that as well. Let me see if I can pull this up here. So this is another video and you can see, I can actually pull this around. Here's Joe again. We're gonna see what he has to say for a moment. Hi there, everybody. My name is Joe Volevsky. I'm a Wolf Ridge naturalist and I'm out here standing on Wolf Lake in January. Maybe about 14 inches of ice, snow everywhere. It's a glorious day. Right over in that direction, main campus of Wolf Ridge. Marshall Mountain is just right over here. And so what's really cool about off these the videos distance. is um, while he's talking, we can actually scroll around. So we're gonna scroll around and look at some of the things he was talking about. So again, we're back on Raven Lake here, or I think we're on Wolf Lake for this one. Um, and Wolf Ridge campus is up there. And here I will actually get the video going while we scroll so you can see what that's like. If it'll buffer. <laughs> <laughs> there's Marshall Mountain. What I'd like to do is take oh, you on an adventure cool. today Let's to see, see right lichens there. all around us. In fact, I was just walking over and so here. And you can see the power the of these different the videos. Um, um, we could call. even jump further down and we could look at the screen and Joe could talk to us. And while he's talking to us, explain something in front of him, we can actually look around and see Maybe we want to look up at the trees, or maybe um, we decide to use this for a different lesson. We can look at something else. Maybe we want to see if uh, Joe missed Bigfoot walking through the woods somewhere over here. <laughs> uh, so that that was a really cool, um, a really cool tool that we had as well. Uh, then the final thing is having these online virtual learning lessons allow us to bring in experts um, almost easier than we can. But instead of um, bringing people all the way to our site, <clears throat> um, this is a person. Who I was working with a fifth grade class just out of Duluth, and they wanted to know about wolves, and they um, and I connected this to a mapping uh, standard, Minnesota state standard. So I brought in a wolf expert from Voyagers National Park. He works on the Voyagers Wolf Project, and he had GIS collared all kinds of wolves in the park with his team, and so he actually talked to my uh, group for about ten minutes. And this is just I'll just show you a little clip of his presentation here. Again, this will be about a minute or so. You can see what he's talking about. So this, what I've shown here is basically just one wolf from one pack. And this is how we get an idea of where that pack's boundaries are. But what if we wanna know where all the pack boundaries are? We do, the way we get that is by putting these GPS collars on wolves in multiple different packs. And then we can actually look at it and we can see here what that actually looks like. So this wolf right here, the, the one that's in the pink, that's the wolf that we were just looking at right there. So it's the same exact data. But now we've added in the data from all of its neighboring packs too. Um, and again, we can look at how we map that territory in that previous uh, sort of slide and it applies here too. And so by following wolves and seeing where they go, we get to figure out where all these pack territories are and where the boundaries are. And you can see here that these wolves don't like to go into other pack territories very much. So what I wanna show next though, this is just an animation showing the same data and it's showing how this progresses throughout the time, how throughout our season that we do our research. So you can see how we get this as we're actually doing the research. And again, what this shows is just that pack territory map, and it just shows the wolves traveling about. This is just day in, day out, where are they going? And so it's really fascinating to sort of see how the wolves set up their boundaries and their territories. So as you can see, it's just really fun to be able to connect kids with all these resources. Um, and we've had a lot of fun doing it. Again, these are things that we've had to um, adapt to our new environment of this virtual learning, um, but we found a lot of good things to help us do that. Um, so thank you for touring the different resources for me, and I'm going to um, pass it on to our next presenter then. And before it goes to Danielle, uh, Michelle, I think I'm directing this to you. Are the 360 views on the website, are they part of a virtual field trip? They're currently part of a virtual field trip, but you and I are friends. Let's talk. So Danielle, I think you're up next. 
All right. Um, well, just a little temperature update. Let's see here. We're at 22 degrees. Huh? Pretty exciting. I have eaten one cookie and half a cup of tea. Very, very pleasant in here. Um, I did see somebody ask in the chat if your snow cave can run out of air overnight when you sleep in it. And that is something you want to be aware of. It'd be pretty hard to pack it that airtight, um, but it is possible. We have a lot of sticks coming through ours. That's actually how we measured our walls so that we didn't carve too too far out. Um, but those sticks serve as nice ventilation holes too. And I also don't have the door packed super tight. So this snow cave would probably be probably be pretty A-OK -okay to sleep in overnight. Um, but you heard David Steeler just share a little bit about all the adaptations that we've had to make. And we know that we are not alone in making adaptations this year. I think if something, if, if this year has taught us anything, it is about flexibility and adaptation and doing things that you never thought you would do before. So we just wanted to share a little bit of what that's been like, a little bit of behind the scenes of we literally pivoted our entire business model, right? To be having students in person sleeping in this multi, multi uh, building facility to doing everything virtually. And that took, you know, creating all sorts of positioning statements and thinking about marketing and funding and who is our audience and how do we reach them? What type of product do we make? What do teachers want? We had a lot of focus groups with teachers to learn how we could literally be supporting them in this time. Um, and I mean, I personally have learned and grown so much. I never thought I would get to learn how to video edit and do all sorts of fun things. So um, it's, been, it's been a wild ride. And Peter Harris, I believe you're out in the crowd there somewhere. Hi, Danielle, and hi, everybody. Yeah. Hi. So we had, uh, uh, like Danielle and Joe and David, I had some fun times learning about uh, technology and also what people would get out of it. My first experience was this summer um, with doing the, the virtual field trip type things with birds. And it turned out we had kids and adults from all around the country uh, learning about bird songs one day and also about bird banding another day and adaptations of birds. And the bird song one, I remember all of a sudden the camera that I had started to swing around crazily and it's like what do I do and I was able to pass that information on to Danielle so the next time that didn't happen but we was still that have on people. the gimbal yeah yeah the gimbal oh. machine oh my gosh so <laughs> it, we felt like a Hollywood production team you know learning all these new things but the the biggest thing that I learned was just a teacher is a teacher it doesn't matter what it is the way we're teaching it's a lot harder you know, with the virtual thing as you talk to teachers, but we can still do a lot of powerful things. And so that's what I came along with. And most recently talking to a group of kids in, um, where was, we were Phoenix, right? I think Phoenix, Arizona. Yeah. And yep. the questions was incredible. And it was like, how do we deal with all these questions? And we're getting better at it now too. So it's like you have a barrage of questions, which is great because we know that there's interest there. So yes, there's a lot of learning happening, but it's pretty fun. <laughs> yeah, it's been, it's been amazing to watch um, students figure out how to get their voice heard when they literally can't, uh, they can't unmute themselves, right? But there is a chat feature and sometimes students will just fill up the entire chat with like over and over and over again, their, their thought or question. It's like, all right, we hear you. <laughs> But yeah, we've had to learn what does it mean to engage um, through Zoom or Google and, and think of all the tools that we can use to still set learning expectations with everybody and how we are respectful and in a learning community together. But um, Peter, I mean, how long have you been at Wolf Ridge now? I'm the official dinosaur right now at 37 <laughs> years going on 38. So, so yeah. Tell us a little bit about that whole journey, 37 years until now. And, you know, I don't know, we, what kind of technology we're you using 37 years ago to now we're using a gimbal, which is a <laughs> swanky, swanky uh, camera holder thing that Peter and I have had quite the trials and tribulations with. 
Yeah. So, well, first of all, I got a shout out to Jack Bacotta because he hired people that had creativity and <laughs> also some, you know, some fairly young folks and uh, everybody wanted to grab that newest technology, which back in those days, yes, it was a slide machine. And we we're essentially trying to do the same thing that we're doing now. We're trying to engage students with telling a story. And the reasons that we would engage them would be maybe it was something that was rare. You know, so wolves were all around us, but the kids didn't necessarily see wolves very much. I mean, in my 38 years, I've probably seen 15 wolf, wolf packs, which is pretty good. I, I'm excited about that, but it's rare. But still, we could bring that wolf that we could show the tracks of right outside the dorm to them, just like in the virtual story will joke and show the, you know, something that's gone by that's not there and you can have a presence of it. So it would be, um, if it was rare, sometimes it was small. So we could take and put in that big screen in the evening when we told, did these shows, something that they couldn't quite see when they're outside. Maybe it was um, a real small lichen. Maybe it was a different season, I would do that. But also one of the reasons that we would do it is to tell the story of other people that were doing authentic things around us, studying nature. So we worked a lot with biologists um, that were studying wolves. So David Meech, and we did Lynn, had Lynn Rogers uh, telling stories. Uh, so the kids were engaged. So the goals were the same that way. And then one of the next technologies that came in, and I can just remember it happening, is John Colstead bought a VHF recorder. Oh my gosh. The staff got a hold of that, and you would have thought we were ready to go to the moon. I remember going out and a bunch of people were out trying to photograph the local beavers uh, getting out of the, the winter time, you know, the first one out of the ice. And one of the naturalists was uh, David Attenborough. I don't know if you remember that guy from England. He <laughs> had this nature show back way back then. It was, everybody was excited and they're imitating David Attenborough. And this like two minute production became part of their intro to beaver ecology. Whoa, my gosh. And then we had the VHF players where not only was it for beaver class, but we'd get these tapes for all the classes, again, to show the invisible, to show the location and that landscape that maybe they can't see how everything relates. And then, you know, things started to steamroll. We'd have technology like for beavers. And then guess what? We got the Apple IIe that came in. Not only did we not have to use mimeographs, we could actually have staff calculating their own lesson plans and printing them out and sharing with each other. And then the last one, you know, that I'll leave us with is, is the internet and this idea that we could get instant information. And I'll tell Joe Walesky's story. He always is mentioning this. So there's a bunch of us naturalists in this room and we see this thing called the internet. And I think the story goes that one of the naturalists, John Colstead, goes to Joe and says, so can you show me a picture of Raleigh Fingers? And for the people that know baseball, he was the dude that had really long mustache. And I might have them switched around here, but the, this is the story's right. And you know, they go and they push and type in Raleigh Fingers and wow, boom, there is a picture of Raleigh Fingers. That changed our life, getting this information that we could use for excitement and story. And it continued to evolve through then of technology. But essentially the same presence was, was incorporated of telling stories and dealing with the real-time experiences outside. So that's, that's a quick little story of the past. Oh, that's great, Peter. Thanks for sharing. And Joe, I think we have a little bit of a video of some of our current behind the scenes clips. You know, as I'm getting this ready, Peter Harris uh, says that he's a dinosaur, uh, but he's constantly adapting to everything and he'll survive longer than any of us. And he's created so many opportunities for Wolf Ridge. And some of his opportunities have been created because he takes crazy risks on things. And so some of what I'm gonna show you are some uh, related to Peter Harris risks.
All right, filming. This is scene seven, talking about Wait, transplants. I we scene seven, transplants. Oh, weird. Okay. Mike's got it figured out. Okay. Aaron, can you show me Corby? Yeah, let's go see her. Excellent, thank you. Cars, aren't they lovely? I'm a rock, roll, rock and rolling in. Climate adaptive forestry project. I also realized that my markers froze, so this is the last thing that you're gonna see on this whiteboard. I can't write anything else on it. So first I'm gonna hold it out to see what our air temperature is. It says 57. <laughs> <laughs> Give it a minute. <laughs> um, and Danielle, I need to know what to do with my hair. There's a beaver on me. <laughs> I got transplants are ready to go in the ground. Yep, that's all I got. <laughs> <laughs> that's great. Thanks for playing that, Joe. Um, so as you all can see, we have been working really hard together. We've learned all sorts of new skills to develop a new product and I mean, It'll keep changing. It'll keep evolving with whatever the need is uh, so that we can do exactly what Peter mentioned of telling stories and getting stories out, inspiring people to be outside so that everybody can gain all the awesome benefits that come from getting to spend time outdoors and understanding your, your neighborhood, whether that's your, your people neighbors next door or the birds in the trees, all, all sorts of things. So thank you. I'm gonna pass it back to Joe. So now that we've reached this point where we've been able to share some of the things that we've been doing, I think that uh, it's, it's an opportunity now to dive just a little bit deeper into the philosophy of what we've been doing here. And so I'm going to try to find my slideshow again, just a little bit deeper that I left impressing uh, my opinion that teaching is all about relationship building and that that's what we've been trying to do. We do that through laughter. We do that through adventures together. Uh, we try to do that by connecting the naturalist here at Wolf Ridge with the learners and with the landscape. Those are all important. And then I like to think of it as a prepositional pedagogy. So we know what prepositions are, right? We know that we can teach about things. And oftentimes uh, people think that's what teaching really is. We're teaching about things. And those things might be reading, math, science, art, but it's about teaching about. At Wolf Ridge, we've done our best to teach about the outdoors. And that's true. We have been trying to do that but we also wanna teach in the outdoors. So that preposition, it's not just about it because you can do about it from inside a building. You can teach also in the outdoors, which is what we've been trying to do all along. But that's just one step. We can make it more complex. We can teach about reading math, science, and art in the outdoors. And that's one of the things that Sandy Timmerman and teachers from Prior Lake and teachers from Northfield at Prairie Creek and a variety of other places, what they try to do, right? And this is where we're really trying to go. How can we teach with and through the outdoors? That's what David Steeler was talking about. That's what Danielle's been talking about. Peter is the one who really taught us all of that, the dinosaur, and he role modeled all of that for us. So we know that we can teach about reading, math, science, and art. Wouldn't it be fascinating if we could teach with and through reading, math, science, and art? 
And I think that doing these virtual field trips has helped all of us to explore what teaching can be and to think more critically about that and to work with teachers to co-create all of these opportunities, right? And that we've been trying to do these types of things. And as we've been learning to present all of these different types of virtual field trips and adventures in learning, uh, that, that we've been learning more and more about what is the philosophy of what we do. We've been very critical about that. Now, it occurred to me that through all of this, we've demonstrated a few things and we've sort of alluded to the different types of field trips and adventures in learning that we do. But I wonder, Danielle, because you've been the brains to all of this organizing everything, I wonder if it's possible that you could sort of rattle off the different types of programming we have done. Sure. Um, what, well, I'm in the snow cave. We did a live Q&A about a snow cave and provided a, a pre-recorded video about the cave. And um, we've done weather and a lot of animal signs down there on Raven Lake. Um, we've done birds where we get to do bird banding and bring that into a classroom. And I've been talking to teachers just this last week actually who are really excited for a lake or stream study class and where we might actually try to compare a stream here on, on Wolf Ridge property to Lake Superior because that's also really close to us and an amazing resource that we have. So those are to come when it's unfrozen. And back in the in the fall when we were starting to design these we were we did geology on the shore of Lake Superior and earthworks so we built art outside and had students be building theirs too and in that story map feature that David Steeler shared you can enter surveys and actually have students um, upload a photo of what they might make or see so we had students upload photos of their earthworks to share so that when we were together in a group like this we could share some of the, the things that they made as well. Um, those are the ones off the top of my head, but I might be missing some. Oh, forestry. Um, David Steeler has done a lot of forest ecology and forestry. Excellent. And if people wanted to learn more about our adventures in learning, then they're on our website. And I know that there's a whole list of them there. And though uh, in the spring, we created some specific ones and put them on there, that Danielle and others have been guiding us in creating some new ones. And I have every reason to believe that that list will grow. I don't know how fast, but it will grow. It will grow. And as we look to the future, as we look to the future, I imagine that we will still be doing virtual field trips. We'll still be doing them. Don't know exactly how and don't know how they'll be folded in, but I can tell you that working with the Prior Lake Savage Area Schools, that we're exploring how we can blend all of this. So we thought that they were all separate things, but over the next three months, we're trying to blend everything together and just build it all into one big story. And, and I believe that there'll be a time, uh, again, where we'll be doing all of these different types of things with schools, that it won't just be a one-off come to Wolf Ridge for a week sort of a thing. Thing. It will be a relationship. We're trying to build relationships. That's really what we're doing. So what I would like to do is a last thing here uh, before we uh, really close this and open to a question and answer is I would like if everybody who's willing to type between one to five words maximum into the chat about what it's meant to you to have a relationship with nature this past year. Type that into the chat. I think it'd be really fun to see the list. And so what I see here is that having a relationship with nature helps me be calm. It keeps me sane. Nature continues to energize my life and I find adventure there and peace. In fact, it's life-saving. And Heron says it's relaxed, warm, and safe. I agree, Heron. The world, literally, Mary Beth says, it's healing and reflect refreshing. And my legs know all the paths. A fall trip 
to hike the Superior Hiking Trail. Nature is my savior. It's kept me sane. Super engaged with my students and nature is a calming influence. It helps me to relax. It's a place to expand our lungs. I find peace and constant joy and discovery. It's healing and inspiring. I feel connected to something larger. And yet peace again. It keeps me humble and it kept, kept me sane and rejuvenated. Gives me peace and connections. Of course, Connor isn't the only one, but he suggests that it's all about adventure. I agree. It helps us explore our thoughts. And it was a lifeline during this past year. Getting to know the creek near our home brought so much calm. It was tranquil and inspiring and intriguing and healthy. And it was uh, providing much needed peace. Seeing the small changes or something that are missed. Oh, somebody moved from Little Moray to Woodbury, walking the nature trail, loving the trails at Lake Elmo Park. That's great. Calming and peaceful builds friendships with the trees and the plants. Thank you for saying that. Relationships with our, our, our local uh, uh, life besides humans. Emotional way to read others. Peace, adventure, and joy reminds me that this pandemic is temporary. And I think I'm going to end on that one, even though I could keep going, because that's a great one right there, is that this pandemic is temporary and that we have all kinds of opportunities to learn and to explore and to share nature together, which is what we've been trying to do with these field trips. And Danielle, thank you for taking us into the snow cave. David Steeler, Thank you for sharing the, the behind the scenes thing. And Peter, thank you for making us laugh the entire time we've been doing this. And to everybody who's shared with us, thank you for sharing with us. What I wanna do now is turn it over. If there are questions, we might have answers. Are there questions anybody has? You could either type them into the chat or you could uh, just uh, pipe up and ask if you want. For a few minutes, we could do a question and answer. Oh. The question here is, how do you keep your devices from freezing? For example, Danielle's phone and camera. Danielle, you're actually there. You're the best one to answer that. Well, you absolutely must have one of these. It's a backup battery. And we learned that very early on that in our cold temperatures, backup batteries were gonna be necessary. Um, Christopher was a naturalist at Wolf Ridge and helping us figure out all this in the fall. And we did a, a geology trip where I was on the shores of Lake Superior and he was down on the Mississippi Gorge and he was out, it was like er, that October when we got a bunch of snow and it was thundering and lightning and snowing where he was. <laughs> and he just barely made it through the whole field trip. And then she realized, he, and then his phone um, died. So <laughs> backup batteries. <laughs> and we have one question uh, for you again. What's the temperature in the snow cave now? I thought that might end up being a question. So I just checked and it's at 23 degrees. Very nice, just keeps getting warmer. Amber yeah. has a question here, it says, post-pandemic, do we plan to continue these virtual programs? Absolutely. Uh, again, it'll depend on uh, what kind of flexibility we have in our own work lives that uh, when we get the machine of Wolf Ridge running again, we're gonna be really focused on doing that. But I, I don't ever see these disappearing. This is a brand new way to connect, right? And says right here, I'm thinking about schools and underserved audiences who can't afford a trip up there, but could get an experience. You're absolutely right. They could get an experience this way. And that was one uh, point that I don't remember who mentioned it about us teaching a group of uh, third graders in Arizona. My gosh, they weren't going to drive all the way up here. Curious to hear more about how uh, the various technology like the gimbal and the 360 camera 
Uh, Peter Harris is the gimbal pro. Uh, he, I'll, I'll prep him to say something, but the 360 camera is really dummy proof. Uh, even I can use it. Uh, it literally just does what you tell it to do. You set it one place and it takes uh, two images, which are hemispheres, and then it stitches it all together. The only thing you as the user have to know is don't stand on the edge where you know it's going to get stitched. Otherwise, your body is all weird. If you stand in the place where the lens is looking at you, it turns out just fine. <laughs> and I use a GoPro Max uh, and it costs about 600 bucks or something like that. Peter, gimbal. A gimbal, you'll sometimes see big movies making uh, pictures with this very fancy looking device that seems to bend all over the place. It balances the camera so it doesn't look jerky. So you can be essentially behind someone jogging down the trail and it gives it that Hollywood look. Uh, we can zoom in on uh, things. It can do amazing, amazing tricks. And the other trick as we learned is an iPhone does marvelous work as a camera, close-ups, uh, a lot of stuff. So there you go. Yeah. And I'm going to end on this, not a, not a question, but just a comment, Sandy. I think this is for you and all the work that you've made possible, is that uh, somebody here says they just wanted to say thank you for the virtual learning you're doing with Prior Lake fifth graders. My son was so looking forward to this trip after hearing how much fun his sister had. Oh, bummer. Oh, man. And we were the last group that got to stay in the campers. Oh, my gosh. Like you were talking about. Yeah, I got to volunteer that year and we'll never forget that. Thank you for sharing that. I think that on that, even though there might be some other questions, I think that basically I want to thank all of you. And I told Russ, who is the chairman of our board, uh, to, that I give him a few minutes uh, to say a few words. And then when we're done, uh, a few of us are going to stay on. Anybody who wants to stay on and literally ask a question, I'll let you do that. But right now, I think that I'm going to put it on Russ. You're on, Russ. Joe, thank you very much. And thank you for the staff. Uh, a great job of telling our story during this difficult time, uh, navigating through the pandemic and still keeping Wolf Ridge uh, viable in the world of uh, environmental education. You uh, have been very flexible. We've created a lot of new uh, programs and opportunities going forward in the future. Uh, I wanted to um, mention two people who just recently have agreed to fund these uh, presentations of the 50th anniversary speaker series. Uh, they're both friends of mine. Uh, Galen Harms from Fortune Financial, who I think is on tonight, and Scott Gisselson from North Star Resource Group. They've, uh, they've agreed to be sponsors for the uh, remaining 50th speaker series presentations. And we do have more scheduled. And also, I want to remind people that uh, you have an opportunity to help us financially if you are so inclined. I think the most recent reminder for this presentation, there's a link there to donate if you so desire, or you can go on our website and find a way to donate. Uh, this has been a very difficult year, but on the other side of the coin, it's been a very invigorating year, I think, for the staff that was uh, still employed here at Wolf Ridge. You guys have really pushed the envelope, expanded our horizons, and a lot of those I think will continue, as Joe said, even when we have kids back. And we all want students back as soon as it's safe. And we want kids to experience the outdoors and learn. So thank all of you for attending. Uh, you're very uh, dear to our, all of us uh, as supporters and people interested in outdoor education. Have a great evening. Excellent. So I'll share one last thing. Thank you, Shell, for reminding me. I, I always forget the some of the important details. We've got more of these coming up. On March 18th, we have an evening with R.T. Ryback. And then in April, the date hasn't been exactly set, but we, we get to meet our farmers in the Finland area. And so Sarah Meyer and uh, other farmers like David Abaz and Stefan Meyer. And so we're going to be doing those. And then if any of you have ideas and you want to leave those in the chat, uh, Shell and I and others are looking for ideas that would be interesting to you as we celebrate uh, our 50th year. So I just want to say one more time, 
thanks everybody for being here. Danielle, thanks for being out there in that cushy, swanky snow cave. David Steeler for sharing everything. Peter Harris for sharing your silly stories. I love it. I love working with this team. Thanks everybody. Have a great evening.